Thanks for joining me on another podcast. My guest today is Tony Loughran, a former Royal Navy Commando medic, now a global risk specialist with over 30 years international experience as a safety and security professional. On this episode, we discuss his time in the senior service and deployments and attachments with the Mountain Arctic Warfare Cadre, his 14-year stint as head of international risk at the BBC in London, where he pioneered a safety culture in the news business, adapting the skills he had acquired in the military to the needs of journalists at the sharp end, how he established his own security consultancy business, Zero Risk International. Tony is also a published author, and we finish off with his book, Zero Risk. Finally, it would be great if you could rate the podcast on Spotify or iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast from, as this helps me know how we're doing and gets the content out to other people. If you do like the pod and would like to support it, then you can check out the Buy Me A Coffee link in the show notes. Hope you enjoy it. Tony, thanks for coming to the podcast, mate. It's been a long time planning this one and all the way from Australia, so thanks for coming on. You're welcome, Colin. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, following in the footsteps of uh, my old mucker, uh, Nigel Devonish as well, so I can't, you can't get better than that. Yeah, it was nice for listeners. It was nice that linked us up and uh, a bit of a legend in the Royal Marines from what I can understand, Nigel. And he's, I've had lots of good messages about that podcast. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for having me on the program. No, you're welcome, okay. mate. So can you start? By telling us, mate, when you joined the Navy, what made you enlist yeah. and an overview of your career? Very, very funny story for me. It was, uh, what happened was I wasn't really getting on at home. And, you know, I think if you look at 99.9% of servicemen, like they've come from a kind of a, you know, uh, disenfranchised kind of existence or whatever, like, you know, and, and uh, I bombed in every single qualification going. And uh, funny story, I, went, I was working as a pot lad in, in a, a club, a Catholic club in Liverpool, which was, it was really hard work, actually. And, this guy walks in one day, like, and he's got two beautiful girls on his arms, and he pulls out this massive wadge of cash from his top pocket. And I thought he must be kind of a, you know, a local kind of celebrity or millionaire. And I said to him, "Where do you work, then, mate?" And he goes, I, "I'm in the navy." And I went, "That's my job. That's exactly what I want to do." <laughs> <laughs> but he only had the money for so, that weekend. <laughs> he never told you that. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Then, then exactly. So nowadays, like I know that some of the army boys, like you now they save up all the cash and put on a horse. <laughs> you know, if the horse doesn't come in, that's it. Like you know, they cry for a couple of weeks. But uh, now that that was me in a nutshell, really, Colin. I, I kind of um, I kind of joined up secretly. Didn't tell my family. Uh, letter came through the post, like on Her Majesty's service, and that you know, I, my mum said to me, like you know, you've you been in trouble again, yeah, because normally that was what it, it was all about. And I said, no, nah, I've joined up, and they were really gobsmacked. And you know, I kind of. Never really looked back, and I I was surprised and shocked that I did really well in the actual kind of the entry test, and uh, it put me in the medics category, uh, which I didn't realize what I was in for, uh, following basic training. Like, you know, I was literally kind of rolling onto about three years continuous uh, training to get you up to a really high standard, you know, and I was very, very fortunate to uh, to be accepted. Yeah. What, what year did you join? Gosh, it would have been 1981, 82. Yeah, right about there. So, yeah, I, I never forget it because basically I looked at, um, at at Lime Street Station and I saw a couple of people trickling through and I noticed one guy that I went to the recruitment center with and, you know, and it's funny because I met him earlier on and I said to him, like, well, what, do you, what do you want to be? And he went, I want to be a medic. And I went, I'll do that as well. Hmm. So I had no intention of doing anything. I said, you know, all, I, all I want to do is get past that first base of, of doing the examination. But as soon as I left Liverpool, and said goodbye to my family, my friends, and all that stuff. I never felt homesick. Uh, mm. I just had this particular desire, you know, to, to leave because I'd left when I was a kid at 10 years of age to go and live in Malta with my uncle for a bit anyway, you know, short space. But that gave me the bug. It really did. It was like, now I, I need to get out of Liverpool. I need to do something with my life, really, you know, at the end of the day. I think, as you alluded to earlier on, that is a real drive of the service people, especially back when I joined up roughly the same time as you. And I just couldn't envisage seeing myself living where I lived for the rest of my life. And I think you either get out by joining the services or maybe go to university. But I don't know about you, but university wasn't a, a route of choice back then. People from my background didn't go to uni. Well, I struggled. I kind of uh, went to sixth form college to see if I could actually reset my O-levels and uh, also do my A-levels. 
And I think I'd come out with a handful, maybe one or two, I think, at, at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, the, the funny thing is, is I, I, I think I was just heading for the, a real dodgy side of life, really. And I was getting really kind of frustrated with myself, you know, because I wanted to do something better, something different. And, and people, what I didn't realize about this, Colin, is that, you know, at the time when I left in 1981-82, apparently there was about 750,000 people that year left uh, Liverpool. You know, uh-huh. so there was a huge exodus of people that wanted to just go and get a better life. And it was it was probably the time when, you know, everything was kind of going on a bit of a downturn, ready for the actual depression side of it. But uh, I never looked back. And, you know, and, and when I did come back on leave, or off leave, I should say, I remember kind of chatting to my friends and they loved football and I, I do too. They loved the Beatles and they loved music and all that stuff. But I just thought they didn't really want to know anything about anything else, you know, and, and I felt that I was a bit of a loner mm. coming back and having this experience, like, you know, in, in um, joining up and, you know, meeting various people and looking at what my pathway was going to be. So I kind of very soon became kind of a little bit kind of disenfranchised, but always found Liverpool as close to my heart as a town anyway. And once you finished your medical training, did you go on board ship? What was your deployment like? So I came, I actually kind of had a really good pathway. I came straight back into the Royal Naval Hospital in Plymouth. And uh, I was there for the best part of about a year, I think it was. And then I got a, I got a really nice break, actually. I was working as a, a junior medic on there, one of the ships called the HMS Galatea, uh, which was called the Black Pig. That was the nickname for it. Bloody old, kind of rusty kind of thing or whatever. And the big thing with that one, it was actually an anti-submarine kind of missile um, it fired missiles from an Akara deck, which meant at the end of the day, the missile would actually seek out the uh, the submarine and destroy it. But it was going on the Medita- Mediterranean cruise. <laughs> when I say cruise, mess yeah. aside, <laughs> rephrase that. <laughs> You're starting I to say- it was sold to me as a cruise. <laughs> You're starting to say like the RAF now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just don't have the smoking jacket like in the cocktail cabinet to go with it. So, <laughs> but uh, but that was uh, that was funny for me uh, because. I I got my first taste of, of sea life and uh, I loved it. I, I just thought it was amazing. We had this incredible exercise with the uh, the NATO kind of fleet. Uh, they were kind of flying around everywhere with the Americans on board. We had everybody else and, you know, saw some brilliant places. And, you know, I wrote about it in my book actually about like, you know, some of the uh, some of the ventures that we had. Again, I was kind of 21 years of age and all of a sudden I'm in, in Venice, you know, for Christ's sake. You know, and you think to yourself like, you know, that would never have happened in a million years for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and at 21 years of age, I'm getting busted as well for jumping off the Rialto Bridge, uh, completely uh, <laughs> off my face on uh, some of the local beer. <laughs> so obviously, uh, yeah, it's good. You're and cruising around the Mediterranean then, and um, you decide you want to be a commando. How? Did, what made you do that? Make that decision? Now that wasn't made for that wasn't my decision, and, and uh, I talk about this in some of the lectures I give about kind of direction and leadership. And there was a gentleman called Dave Poole who uh, had already passed his commando course and uh, was in uh, in the commando units as a medic. And uh, he called me up one day and he goes, Oi, Scouse. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, I, I believe you did really well with the medical because I actually got a, a top student award on the medical uh, course. And he said to me, I've got just the job for you. And I went, what? And he goes, you like open fields? And I went, yep. Yeah. He goes, do you like <laughs> cold weather environments? Well, I come from Liverpool for Christ, I think, so it's going to be fine for me. And he goes, mate, I put you on the commando course. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> and I was like, hang on a sec, whoa. And I said, so when, when am I starting? And he goes, in January. So I'd only just come back off you know, this, this ship's visit anyway by November. And I said, hey, mate, I, I wouldn't mind going on it. I said, but can you put me in for the warmer environment, like June or July? Because, you know, anyway, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you're, on, you're on the course. So that was it. I got uh, selected to go on the course. I did the beat up first of all, and that was kind of a, an interesting thing in Seton Barracks with them. Um, a lot of the army guys, a lot of the uh, parachute regiment, and uh, some of the RAF guys actually as well. And slowly but surely, to be honest, you probably know this anyway. A lot of them kind of fell by the wayside. I didn't. I was kind of really happy to be outdoors and you know mucking in. Were you always into your PT on board? You always keep yourself quite fit. Yeah, I still do to this day. You know, I swim kind of a few k you know a day and kind of you know do a lot. I've got to get a bit of a knee up, but I'm doing kind of you know running. But at the same time, like, you know, I've I've never had a problem with fizz. Uh, I had a few injuries on the commando course. Luckily, I had a weekend to kind of get over it and get, get back on the actual kind of the on the ground again. Uh, but it was great. But it, it just seemed to me this really great journey from going from one thing to another, to another, to another. And, you know, I kept up my, my physical skills and my fitness and that. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I actually got the commando medal as well. <laughs> oh, did you? Well, 
Yeah. So at the end of the course, I didn't even know what it was. And, you know, I don't know if you know about this, but when you get your green beret at the end of the course, what happened was I remember kind of the actual, the commandant in general, whatever it was that was looking after the the presentation. And uh, all of a sudden I'm looking along the row, like, and I could just see people kneeling down on the floor because he just finished the 30 miler, the big commando test, the final one anyway. And uh, they read out my number, you know, D1914988, and that was a step forward. And all of a sudden, like he said, he awarded the commando medal, you know, for uh, teamwork and kind of, you know, spirit, esprit, esprit de corps, which meant at the end of the day, apparently it was dragging a few people up certain places and carrying things for them and all that stuff. And the, the training team, Chunky Phelps and um, some of the other guys, like, you know, that uh, the old and bolder, they clocked me and, and turned around and, and uh, you know, it was a decision. So I was, I was very, very uh, humble, you know, to, to get that. It was, it was quite an achievement, really. Yeah, no mean achievement at all. Once you passed the commando course and you got your berry and your, your dagger, what was life like as a commando medic? Well, I didn't even, my feet didn't even touch the ground again because Dave Paul, uh, Dave Paul called me up again from Hamaway's house, commando training, you know, the centre itself, commando HQ. And he goes, well done, mate, commando medal, fantastic. He goes, uh, we've got you into the MNAW card. And I said, uh, that's that? how you know knowledge. Yeah. And he goes, outdoors again, fella. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, I basically, I found out that I was medical cover for the twos course, the ML twos course. Uh, but what happened by default, uh, really, Colin, is that the first kind of year I was there, I, I got involved in the course. I, I didn't actually kind of sit back, you know, whatever they did, I tried to do as well. Like, you know, there were obviously gaps when they were doing their own tactical stuff, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I had, honestly, the best bunch of blokes i ever come across. And uh, Nigel in particular, you know, some of these guys had actually just come back from the Falklands, like, you know, so... You know, you ended up with kind of Tim Holloran. <clears throat> there was Rocky Stone. There was uh, there was also Nigel Devonish and, you know, Des Wassel as well, who was the former RSM, who sadly passed away uh, a couple of years ago. But these were legends. And Fred Poyser was the actual TQ as well, who at the end of the day was fierce, absolutely fierce. And then, you know, of course, you end up with the, the Dutch Marines that were coming on the course. The Australian SAS came on the course as well. You know, so I was rubbing shoulders with, you know, what I would consider, you know, the elite of climbing as well. Mm. And uh, one of the first courses, I think, or second course, was Gordon Messenger, who went on to uh, to meet the general on show for, yeah, I've got a great photograph of me and him, you know, absolutely skin in essence, uh, me looking like a butch, you know, slim <laughs> as a butcher's dog, <laughs> <laughs> just about to climb in in Switzerland somewhere, like you know, and uh, and I've met up with him since once at a reunion. The guys themselves, like you know, they put their necks on the line for you, uh, as you know, you know, in in the military terms. And I felt the same way with these guys as well. So there's been a few moments when I was in the Arctic, for instance, where things weren't working out for me. You know, one of the lads, Billy Baxter, in particular, stepped up and, and looked after me. And, and I looked after them as well mm. in return. So uh, we do keep in touch with each other and, and we have a bit of a laugh about everything, really, like, you know. Were you posted, so you'd, you'd went to the Carter for a couple of years and then you were posted somewhere else. How did your, your career pan out from that stage onwards? So back in about 1989, 1990, I think it was, like, you know, I, I decided, like, you know, from my point of view, probably about 10 years, 10, 11 years in, I did some reserve work on top of that as well. But I just really kind of thought to myself, I, I think I'm going to come out at some stage. Like, you know, I just, I, I, I think I probably had a, a kind of a system of rotation where you were just doing the same thing, same thing, you know, and I didn't feel things were changing. And I said to my boss at the time, I said, I'm, I'm thinking of leaving. And he said, oh, look, if you're leaving, tell me now. He goes, because we need to train somebody up very, very quickly to get to your standard. Because they'd, they'd had a succession of medics in there, like that they actually kind of had been there and got rejected uh, for one thing and another. But what happened to me, Bob Ewan, who was the actual kind of WO2 at the time, he actually pulled me into uh, L Company and 4-2 Commander. And he said to me, you can, you can ride your rest of your career out with us. So the first thing I did, I did a winter deployment with them, which was really tough. It was bloody cold. It was, you know middle of nowhere, fighting company, probably 270 guys or whatever that you have to kind of, you know, keep in, in check and all that stuff. A lot of injuries, hell of a lot of injuries. Like, you know, we had one guy, as I got taken out by the uh, the whip area on the radio. That's plenty of hell. Uh, he, only, he's 18 years of age, Colin, like, you know, and he bent down to actually kind of bring, bring something out of his rucksack or his bergen. And uh, he'd forgot to put the cork on top of the edge of the uh, copper wire. And it just snapped his op optic nerve, like, you know. So I had him flown back onto our Royal because we'd actually just literally started the exercise off. We ended up with a horrendous time that year. We were supposed to be going into, back into the snow holes after we dug them that first couple of weeks in. And the snow holes had collapsed and everyone had taken our kind of Bergens away in the uh, the chopper. And uh, 
we ended up with uh, swinging temperatures of minus 30 to plus five degrees and rain as well. And then back into minus 30. So we ended up with guys literally frozen, stiff, like, you know. You talk to him, it's been the forces, especially frontline forces. Everybody knows people yep. have been killed by accidents or badly injured. I had a friend who um, lost an eye during Northern Ireland training because somebody decided to throw a track pad off an armoured vehicle during riot training. Took wow. him, crushed the side of his skull, took his eye out. Another friend of mine went to 148 battery. A guy called Dinger, parachuting in Norway, and he got drowned in a fjord parachuting. So I think most service people wow. can recount serious injuries and excess. if you're training hard there's always going to be problems yeah it's inevitable i think one of the swinging things for me really was that what well, swinging vote for me really was that there was a couple of things that that happened and i i felt we were at, we were going into a bit of a cover-up phase you know within defense and it's horrible to say that you know because my, my comrades and my kind of my, my team and everything else were kind of you know die hard kind of supporters of, i was of them as i mentioned before but i just felt generally like you know that we had some incidents really where people should have been a lot more kind of open about what happened, you mm-hmm. know. And I just felt at the end of the day that there was certainly a time when the kind of the um, NCO level was being stripped out and right in the middle of that particular kind of uh, authority loop. And I found that the young officers themselves were actually kind of taking the decisions on everything really, where at the end of the day, you missed that particular experience of the likes of your Nige Devonishes or, you know, your Rocky Stones or some of the guys that, you know, have come through all these particular you know, senior leadership courses and, you know, done a hell of a lot in the operational world as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I just felt that I just needed to, it was my time to, to go really, you know, and, and I, I left on, on a good account. And this was after 14 years. And did you decide at that point you knew exactly where you were going or what was the situation? No, so, so it was literally after 10 years, to be honest with you, because basically I did a couple of years after that, like, you know, for the reservist list, uh, I was working heavily on the reservist list. But, but what happened was it was kind of interesting because somebody... Uh, we were doing it. We were kind of doing a. Uh, oh God, what was it called? It was a. We call it death slides, as you say in the forces, like you know. But they, they call it zip wire over here in Australia. Mm-hmm. Sounds a bit more kind of tame. Uh, but the death slide <laughs> itself, <laughs> there's only there's only one kind of you know connotation you can actually kind of get from that one. Really, we did a, a celebrity thing for Tomorrow's World, where at the end of the day they were doing a program on fright, flight, and fear. Maggie Philbin, I think it was, was the was the presenter at the time. Like you know, she was married to Keith Jaguar, if you remember. She came down and you know we did it uh, at Fog and Talk, which was like a big kind of quarry. You know, we rig- rigged up the actual death slide. And I got chatting away to the boys and got chatting away to the safety advisor. He was from the BBC. And he said to me, when are you leaving? I said, oh, probably in a couple of years' time. And he said, oh, I'll see if I can find you. He said, we're always looking for kind of, you know, advisors to help us out. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a funny story. I kind of went to work on the rigs and I was only on the rigs for a short time. And uh, a phone call was patched through to the actual, the, the well deck. Uh, or the op shack, and it was this guy, and he said to me, he said, I told you to find you. I was like, what? In the middle of the North Sea. Yeah. He then turned around and said, would you like to come for an interview? We've got a job going for a, a safety advisor for TV production work. So I went down there, and another funny thing happened to me. It was the night before I went for the interview, I got absolutely smashed with my cousin and uh, fell out of this, this blues bar, ripped my interview suit. And, you know, it wasn't looking good for the following day. <laughs> But luckily, and you're going to love this one, and I'm sure your kind of listeners would love it. Luckily, two out of the three on the panel were former uh, army guys and uh, recognized something was a mystery. I can't spare it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the funny thing is, when I finally got the job, which was even funnier, two of the blokes came up to me and they said that they were killing themselves laughing. They said, <laughs> I think you were close to spewing that day because you'd had, we knew you'd been on the, on the source the night before. And they had bets to figure out whether, you know, when I was going to spew. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the job <laughs> I did I, well I, I got a I got a contract and um, I moved my wife up from uh, Plymouth and I had a you know a young daughter there but to be honest with you Colin this one's really good for the kind of the service guys I couldn't rub you know two pennies together it was really weird coming out after so many years getting parachute pay what was then a, a, a kind of a, a an elite pay or whatever it was called you know diving pay and all that stuff yeah. It meant nothing. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm, I'm on a really bad wage. And as God is my witness, I was living in Tunbridge Wells. I had to commute into the BBC and I literally had to bunk the train, okay, and not pay just so I could get into show that I was willing to do this job. You know, it was awful, really, from that point of view. Yeah. I think one of the skills when you get out, and, and this happened to me, you don't know how to negotiate a wage, you don't know your worth. And I remember joining a company. And uh, I was grateful to be on parity with what I left with because I was told at the time, you're going to take a wage drop. 
And uh, I remember that eight months into my job, we went out on a business trip and I talked to the HR manager and she had a few drinks and she said to me, we got you cheap. And uh, so I, I did a bit of delving and when it came round to my um, appraisal, I, I boned up, I knew how to negotiate and I got myself <laughs> a whack. But so MD listen to get out of the army, know your worth, know about negotiating of pay. It's yep. not like the army or the, or the navy or the marines. You're not on a fixed pay scale. Everybody knows what everybody else is on. You know, you really need to yeah. do your homework and know, know how to negotiate. Yeah, look, that's a really good tip, actually, Colin, because I think that uh, from my point of view, I was really wet behind the, he- the ears anyway. And I, I think what happened was that, you know, you just become so grateful to get a job that you just think at the end of the day, you'll take it. You know, and, and look, who wouldn't actually be grateful? It was the BBC. It was a, oh, a brilliant good. stepping stone for me in my career. You know, and even my mates say to this day, uh, how the hell did you manage to get that? Like, you know, it was kind of uh, the most amazing kind of transition for me, uh, even though I did it tough. Because for those who know about the offshore industry, you know, at the time in the 80s, like, you know, or not, sorry, 90s, it was really fickle. And what was happening was that I was actually on a contract and I was actually, I just left and even before I did the BBC job. So I was actually traveling in a car all the way up to Scotland, like, you know, to Dice and to be told I wasn't required. And I had to come all the way back again. So I didn't even draw a wage, you know, so it was brutal. And that sometimes was through winters as well, you know, when, when it wasn't very nice to travel. And uh, I didn't know what, what to do, didn't know where to turn. So to me, it was like a, a beautiful moment in my life, really, where I thought I've got to give it a crack. And my, unfortunately, my, uh, my, my wife, uh, Tracy, uh, and this is not really down to her fault, really. I think she got really homesick and wanted to go back to Plymouth, you know, to the the garrison effectively, like, you know, where, where it was all happening with all the commando units and the, the various of the Navy establishments. And it was, you know, it was buzzy, buzzy. But we were in sleepy Tunbridge Wells and she really didn't like it. And, and then mm. I had to make a decision to, to carry on because I could see a really nice career trajectory for myself anyway. And I dug my heels in and I had a brilliant time in TV production, doing all the investigations into, you know, the likes of uh, some of the injuries and deaths on these tenders and the top gears and, and everything else for that matter, you know, that, that kind of stuff really kept me really engaged, you know, and I loved it. Yeah, getting involved in it. So it's fantastic. How did you negotiate? You've you've come from a, a military career that's top flight. You're at the top end of service personnel performing at a high level themselves, very competitive, very unique military cultural background. And then suddenly you're in the BBC. Substantially different cultural atmosphere. How is that to negotiate? That's a really, really good question, actually, because I'll give you both sides of, or both ends of the scale or the spectrum. On one hand, I actually found that people at the BBC at the time, certainly in my division that I was at, there was quite a lot of dead wood. There was a lot of people who really were just continuing on to do their own particular job and really didn't care, you know, because they, they were trapped in this pension scheme with the BBC. But on the other hand, what I did was I actually I managed to gain grace and favor from some of the actual film directors and some top end, top end, top end people who were executive producers and so on and so forth, who just knew exactly what I was worth, you know, to be out on location all the time and provide them advice on diving. I was a, you know, I was a massive diver at the time and uh, also weapons and stunts. And it was just like, it was like, you you could, you know, you you couldn't have written the script better really for me. Um, So I fell into that role, but my turning point, to be honest with you, Colin, was, was really when uh, 1996, I think it was, Joan Schofield, radio reporter, was killed in, in Croatia. And uh, literally, I started the BBC then, and I had to bring his body back. And uh, I left the BBC news team to actually you know, sort out the autopsy and everything else for that matter. But I went back into Croatia, and I was moving around. And, and see, what happened then is a lot of people then turned around and said, actually, what's the point in him being in, in uh, TV production He's better off in news because his skill set is more akin to, you know, the actual the war zone operations or the kind of civil un- unrest areas and so on and so forth. So I fitted in really, really well in news, and I had a fantastic ex- deputy director boss, a guy called Eric Bowman, who's a parachute regiment guy. He was hilarious, and he used to just call me Marine Boy. He goes, "Oh, Marine Boy, <laughs> what do you want, Para? <laughs> I got another job for you, mate." And one of the jobs was to look after the security for Princess Diana. And- which was really but the, early the, on in my career. The interview. Uh, yeah. And there was only three of us that knew about it at the time. That's the Bashir one. You know, so, yeah, it was, which went a little bit south, obviously, with his particular kind of, you know, his, uh, his making up the, or fabricating some of the evidence or whatever it was that, that happened, but it was quite sad. 
But no, you know, to, to your original question there, like it was kind of a, an interesting transition for me. And I think that what happened was I gained a huge amount of respect uh, because I said it as it was and as it is. And look, I, I actually had a few cock-ups along the way, but what was really good for me was that uh, the guys that I worked with backed me up every single step of the way, you know, because they knew for a fact that, you know, people are allowed to to make a cock-up and, you know, they, yeah. they learn from the mistakes. And that's what I was I was doing, really, at the end of the day. It was great. I think Force's background gives you what you said. You, you, you're not scared to speak your mind and uh, you'll tell it as it is. But there are some other paths what, you need to... Say, mate, go on. I was going to say, just on that, you'll you love this one. So, so I'm kind of two years into the job and I'm really proud of it and all that stuff. Like, and I'm moving into the news environment. And uh, I decided to invite uh, five of the guys up from uh, Fort Two Commander uh, for a night out. Uh, in London, but I said, "Don't worry about accommodation. We'll sleep in the office in Television Centre." Uh. <laughs> and the following day, security guy wakes me up and kicks me on the floor, and he goes, "Oi, mate, have you got five mates that are staying in?" And I tried to kind of, you know, fudge it and say, "No, no, no, no." All of a sudden, like you know, I found two guys have actually kind of run the, the top of the stairwell, like slumped over this rail. Uh, one of the other guys is being caught peeing over the top of the rail, like you know, which is fourteen floors up, and another guy, piece de resistance, actually. He walked on set on the uh, breakfast news set, like, you know, in the morning. And someone grabbed him before he actually went on with just his undies on. So I was, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you realize then it's time to adjust a bit more to Sevy Street. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, not, I would, but, but that's. Go on, I was going to say, that's the one area where the, I got the backing of the boss, uh, Mike Reason, who, uh, you know, I, I thought, that's it. I'm toast. I'm gone. Like, you know, my, my contract's been ripped up and all that stuff. But he just left. So I'll, these things happen, mate. I mean, I was very lucky. I, I worked in the aerospace industry, and, and like yourself, I was working in, as a civilian running projects in Afghanistan and Iraq, that type of thing. I'll mention his name, not his full name, because you know, you'll know who he is, Andy. Directed me into being a civilian manager. And I remember we came out a meeting with the Army one day, and I'd been at the company about nine months. And the Army, who were running, we were running the contract for, had been very obtuse, very single-minded, wouldn't listen to civvies. Yeah. And I came out. And we went for a wash up in uh, in the hotel, and I was going. I was going on about the bloody army. They'll never listen. And he goes, "That was you eight months ago." <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he sort of stopped, it comes around. He sort of stopped me in my tracks. He goes, "You know," he goes, "You weren't that easy to work with when you first got out." <laughs> Post Cold War, there was the, the famous peace dividend against the Russians, where we could downsize our forces and all the rest of it. But actually, what that then led to th through the 90s and the 2000s was a bit more instability in the world. We started seeing problems in the Balkans and they're leading up to Afghanistan and Iraq, and I'm sure we'll talk about them in a minute. But when you were talking about that reporter being killed and you were starting to get involved in that world, did they do any training before they went to war zones back then? And what was the training like and what did you then do to improve it? Give credit where credit's due. There was a guy called Andy Sumner who actually kind of was running first aid courses, battlefield first aid courses for the BBC. And uh, my particular kind of um, investigation, uh, preliminary investigation, really, when John's body was brought back, it was I, I walked straight into the uh, the head of news gathering's desk, a guy called Chris Kramer, again, passed away sadly. Uh, and I said to him and, and Richard Sandberg, Richard Sandberg, you know, needs all the credit for backing me because... Budgets were a bit tight. The war zone itself was stretching the BBC's budget to the limit. And I said, you're really on on thin ice here. I said, you're training people to uh, to patch people up, which is great, and it's actually noble of you. I said, but you're not training people from a pre-loss insurance or a, uh, a basically a proactive kind of uh, pitch anyway to, to look at really how you can recognize danger, you can recognize risks as well. And the very first course I did was in a hotel, and I was given a check. Mm. to run this course for two days. And I and I said, categorically, I said, if we were training to go into war, okay, whether it's Belfast, whether it's kind of guerrilla war, whether it's any other particular, you know, with the Falklands and all that stuff, then at the end of the day, you know, you wouldn't just be having, you know, two days training. Why on earth would you expect the journalists themselves to be wandering into the same theater of operation and, and uncertainty uh, with no backing or support? So I got the check, I ran the course, and it was a real success. And so much so that you know the likes of Kate Aidy came on the course, Martin Bell, John Simpson. John Simpson uh, recently gave me a huge rap uh, in my book as well, which is obviously come, it's come, it's just come out in UK, 
and mentions the fact that it, you know that I revolutionized the safety and the security really for the BBC and also for journalism because no one had a real hostile environment course at that stage. And uh, we put into it a lot of effort and uh, we managed to get something that was half decent. And then it tended to, you know, from two to four days to, to five days. But they never had anything. They never had any operational kind of support. Uh, sorry, they had one guy who was a former army guy who uh, got logistics ever, you know, for them, which was fantastic. He got them some really old mm-hmm. style body armor with these steel plates, which was really, really dodgy. And uh, so what I did was I went, not only did we start running the hostile environments courses, I started to run all of the actual PPE and went into Courtauld's Aerospace and got uh, a body armor set designed for journalists and also for female journalists as well, which Kate Eddy was chuffed to bits with. Kate was fantastic, Colin, as well. And, you know, talk about, and she, she was really an advocate for the training and also for fitness as well. And I remember giving her the first set of body armor that I designed anyway with Courtauld's. And she put it on and she wanted me to wait in her apartment while she ran up and down the stairs quite a few times. And she went, no, that's that's fine. That's really good. Thank you very much. There was that. But there was also kind of the additional things like the first aid kits. The Then we went into chemical and biological stuff uh, to do with respirators and suits. And then my real breakthrough, which was a great one, I, and I pulled in a favor from a friend who now works for me, actually. He's been working for me for about probably on and off 25 years. And uh, he was in charge of the Hounslow public order uh, area. And what I'd done is I'd seen in Belfast just exactly how journalists were actually kind of petrol bombed or, you know, bricked or whatever. And I just witnessed so many people injured and patched a few people up as well. So I just turned around and said, why haven't you got anything on public order? Why don't you kind of trade journalists in that? And of course, I got some money for that, you know. So we then had the, the contract to train with the Metropolitan Police. And it was the first ever... Uh, mixture of journalists and, and police as well because they obviously didn't go in the, in those days and it worked really, really well because they could get an understanding uh, and, and an experience of two days submerged yeah. in the village, the mock village in Hounslow where the horses were charging through the streets and the petrol bombs were coming in and uh, you know we secured a really great safety and survival tool really for journalists Did, to, to use. All the courses so, you designed yeah. and ran, were they all in-house? Did you bring MDLs in or was it all purely this was designed for BBC journalists? Yeah, look, I brought Nigel uh, to to help me out actually when he first left the mob, and a guy called Paul Reese as well, who had a company called Centurion, and uh, he got a lot of the guys from kind of from the commando world to come in. I'd already gone to look at some of the courses that were being designed at the time, and uh, it was mainly on the back of the battlefield first aid course, and they were really good. But I, I just felt that we had the edge, and it was like better the devil, you know, for me. And and I, I brought them in, and they ran the contract, you know, for probably the best part of something like eight years. You know, it was, it was kind of a, a big contract for them. But like with all things, you know, I'd ever got a chance to be involved in it. I'd moved on. I'd have moved up the chains, you know, after that. And uh, literally what happened was it was passed over to another company, uh, former regiment guys, and it went to somebody else as well. So these particular contracts now from a civilian point of view <clears throat> are highly protected because it's like money for jam. What I do, I, I still train. I've just come back from uh, from America training these guys ready for the elections for next year for Haiti and also for, for um, Washington. And the beauty about the courses I run really, Colin, is that I've done so many investigations into what's gone wrong, you know, with journalists and how people are being killed as well, sadly. And obviously the information I've got now is, is imparted back into these training courses. So French press agency, AFP, and everybody else in Channel News Asia, you know, they're loving the courses. When I was running these contracts in Afghanistan and Iraq, I was responsible for the safety, security, and risk management of all the employees out there. And at the time, if you had a government contract, you had to send your, your staff on a condo course, contractors and deployed operations course. It was mandated. You had to have all your people trained. In yes. And it was money. It was, as you say, licensed to print money for these companies. But I would turn up uh, with execs who, had, who wanted from the, the, the risk committee, who wanted to see it. And we'd get a presentation. And there were normally a few Hereford guys there and that type of thing. And uh, I'd be introduced as a security manager, and this is the chief exec, you know, da 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 da. So all eyes would be on the these execs, and I'm the lowly security manager in the corner. And then they'd start talking about the course, and then I'd just start chipping in. Why are you doing this? What about this? What about that? Have you given thought to this? And all of a sudden, they realize then, switch fire to the lowly security manager. Because a lot of the courses, they were just back in the box courses. And I'd say to them, that's not good enough for what we want. You're going to have to adjust your course to feature 
more of what my teams are going to encounter on the ground. It's not taken, we, we saw it in the warm up, we talked about this. It's not taken seriously until something goes wrong, unless you have somebody in the seat who knows what it's exactly like on the ground and what yep. the training should be, as you alluded to when you started at the BBC. It's just a lot of time, it's just a tick in the box exercise, in my opinion. I don't know what you think about that. I, I think you're right. I think what happened was that uh, there was a lot of departments that I remember, even the risk management uh, departments, who were writing these incredible, in depth kind of uh, reports on certain countries around the world. And I did say to them at one stage, have you guys ever been to these areas? A lot of it's open source, isn't it? And I was like, okay, that's right. So basically, you know, you can write whatever you want to kind of thing. And it's even better with AI nowadays. But but the big thing for me, and I I, I totally I totally agree with you, Colin. I think, I think at the end of the day, I think what I got fed up with really was that um, some of the training contractors that were coming through, I'd go down to some of these plush existences, like, you know, and they're all sat around reading the newspaper and I'm going... Hey guys, what's going on here? Like, and they're going, "Oh, we're waiting to start our lecture at you know ten o'clock." And I'm going, "But this yeah. doesn't look like a good image." Okay, <laughs> you should be actually kind of starting to rehearse things or even kind of research, you know, do, you know, whatever it was, can be just become a real cushy little club. Yeah, and and, and to be honest with you, my team for zero risk, like you know, I pull them from everywhere, and they never sit still. They're always kind of throwing in something and saying, "We just had this incident," like you know. So the good thing is, is that what I've got now is all my team are operational. But they do the training as well, you know. So it, it makes it hell yeah. Of a that, that's a fantastic point about putting your people through it's training every so often them to see what it's like from the student perspective. That's a really because then they understand what's being delivered uh, and, and the student experience. You mentioned Croatia and the, and the Balkans initially. There, what other conflict zones did you end up working in? We end up in Chechnya. Uh, I've, I've probably covered just about everything really, like from the BBC's point of view. Uh, Serbia, uh, Chechnya, Pakistan, Afghanistan, back into Somalia. Uh, did some stuff in Somalia. And then Sierra Leone as well. Um, so that stuff, you know, just when the West Side Boys were kicking off over there. Didn't really do much in South America, funny enough. Like, you know, I kind of only went there once. Uh, but then the States, 9-11, I was over in the States literally a couple of days after. And uh, we were doing a lot more, to be perfectly mm. honest with you, on the stories to do with counterterrorism. I was actually kind of more or less inserted and embedded within Panorama. So, you know, it was a real hard-hitting kind of time for us. And um, we had all kinds of different intel to talk about just exactly how, you know, the Al-Qaeda recruitment was going on within Canada at the time and some of the vehicles that were being kind of turned into explosive vehicles as well that were actually going over the border, you know, heading towards New York and, and places like that. I actually kind of went literally from some of the war zones, some of the areas of conflict, you know, straight into how we are going to protect our staff within and uh, in the States anyway uh, for a dirty bomb. Yeah. That was the big worry straight after 9-11, you know, is that one coming as well? And also on top of that, Colin, we had the anthrax outbreak as well. So all of the mail processes, like, you know, I worked on all of that and got everything completely um, vetted as opposed to it coming through to the newsroom and knocking the news out and, and everything else for that matter. Areas of civil unrest, you know, we covered huge amounts of that. And then obviously uh, the likes of the earthquakes in Gujarat and places like that, you know, constantly going out to these areas and uh, looking at resupplies, looking at kind of how we could actually kind of uh, support the teams really. And uh, so I grew the high risk department really from there on, on the back of that. You know, I was actually the one that was running around everywhere, uh, which between you and me put a huge strain on my, my personal life as well, because I just felt yeah. I was always in demand. Tony will do that. He'll get that. You know, and I, I became the chief loggy, you know, kind of security yeah. operator and bottle washer and everything really. It was tough. It's so always on the last for, sort of uh, budget you, line, isn't it? Security budget, uh, the budget for the company oh, God, and then yeah. you've got security well, right at the bottom. I know, and the funny thing is, what well, I suppose with the the pride I can take on this form, like you're exactly right, is like the add-on job almost mm. became the top job, you know, become the priority, you know, because we could prove to the managers that no show, no go. In other words, if you haven't done the training, you haven't had the information instruction or whatever, you know, there's no way you're going to be deploying, you know, into these areas. And and the thing, the, the Schofield situation was quite an interesting one because at the end of the day, and if, including 9-11 as well, is nobody realized logistically where everybody yeah. was at any one given time because there was no accountability. Journalists themselves were running out the door to go and cover something. The editors sometimes would find out when they got in theater and would go, oh, well, you need to come back. And, no, 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 I'm here now. Oh, okay, then fair enough. You can go on there. You know, and I, I saw the other day, the thing that freaked me out a bit, but in Israel, I was actually in Israel a week before all this stuff kicked off in uh, Janine. And I saw a couple of journalists there. They were, good. They were doing um, crowdfunding to see if they could buy, if someone could buy them body armor and a helmet 
I just couldn't believe it. And they were reporting from there with nothing, you know. And I'm going, this is good. This has gone nuts because we've almost like gone right back to when I began with the BBC, where I was not only getting training for staff, but also freelancers, because freelancers would often provide some mm. of the really interesting bang bang stuff for news, but weren't really covered under insurance. And that's so I negotiated the first insurance policy uh, for some of the freelancers as well who, I might add, tended to be kind of some of the ex-service guys that have come out and learned Canberra operations. <laughs> I reckon that's so, going to be you know, a great problem, though, because people are less... It's an interesting risk, time. Companies are getting less risk, risk averse, and by that, companies, I mean news companies, because you can see it currently in Gaza where they're using local people to be journalists, and in some cases, you're losing that impartiality, I think. Yeah. So it's it's a strange period we're in with, with, with journalism, I feel. Well, I, I kind of, as I said, you know, a week before this all kicked off, I was going uh, up to Janina, a friend of mine who I, I've worked with for many years, and it was an investigation I did there 20 years ago in Nablus, uh, where he helped me out to get the evidence to prove to the Israelis that they did kill this guy. And it's interesting because basically I went all the way through uh, with him, and I said to him, I said, "How many Western journalists have been in here in the last week since the Israelis have been hitting, you know, the areas we're in now?" He said, "Virtually a handful." I said, "Why?" And he goes, "Because they've deemed it too dangerous." And he said, "At the end of the day." Um, they haven't really got the appetite. And I said, but surely you as locals would be picked up to do this particular work. And he said, unfortunately, we're not. He said, because they want the voice of an expat, you know, in this particular area to actually date stamp it. And I found that really with the BBC years ago in the BBC World Service when we had very good regional journalists who could actually report from these areas. But at the end of the day, you know, um, <laughs> some of the guys from London were parachuted out there to actually do the job. And uh, some of them were getting beaten up as well because they were yeah, white Caucasian, like in a kind of a, you know. I mean, uh, Vietnam War as well. and uh, Balkans yeah. War sat and it was, it was infamous for journalists sat and filing news reports from hotels in Sarajevo and uh, the major cities in Vietnam. So, but it takes a lot of bollocks, I think, to get out in a place like Gaza if you're a journalist. The thing is, though, what I found, Colin, is that uh, if I come back to the actual the, the Balkans, I called it the war of convenience as far as journalism is concerned because you could actually buy a ticket, uh, a flight from London through to Sarajevo, like, you know, for a hundred quid, maybe less than that. And there you were, you know, the front line, you know. So at the end of the day, it really didn't sit well for me. And that's why there was, there was I think there was about 170 odd journalists that were killed during that campaign, during that five years anyway. A lot more than the NGOs, a lot more than kind of regular army. You know, and that said a lot. And it comes to the very beginning of our conversation, really, where you're saying, did you have any training for journalists? Yeah. Well, there weren't any training. There wasn't anything, I should say. You know, they were literally kind of grabbing this airline ticket and getting over there and, and shooting and that's the bank. Anthony Lloyd the Times, from the reporter, his ex-infantryman, I think it was Green Jackets, but he, he did exactly that in Yugoslavia. He jumped on a plane, he went out there, yeah. started taking photographs and as a, as a freelancer and got himself on the, a newspaper. But... He was army trained, so he probably knew how to risk assess and, and deal with it. But as you say, a lot of people do take some risks uh, and think because I'm older and bolder, I wouldn't be prepared to do that myself. Just you got a wise head on you, mate. That's what it is. <laughs> never older and bold. BBC always gets a bit of stick about impartiality. Uh, do you ever find that a problem? Do you think that's an unfair criticism of the BBC? I don't think it's a criticism of the BBC. I think it's a it's a wider subject, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that I know the BBC is coming for all kinds of different kind of loaded questions and, and uh, you know, kind of scrutiny. Uh, I, I did see the other day, though, John Simpson talking about the word terrorism, you know, and saying at the end of the day that, you know, they can't use that word. I was thinking to myself, like, you know, wow, that this has all changed, you know, and I think that it changed years ago um, when certain individual journalists themselves were kind of reporting away from the BBC and doing their own particular thing, you know, and even before social media was in existence. And they would write for the Telegraph or wh wherever it was and and all of a sudden, we're held accountable, you know, for for, for not really towing the the BBC line or or, or whatever line that, that, that there was. I think I do take. I, I get upset. I must admit, I, because I was when I was in Washington recently uh, last week, I should say. I was I'd talking to a, a group of journalists anyway in this this old Irish bar down downtown. I was saying really the thing that really kind of upsets me a lot is that all of a sudden you get a conflict like this, and and you get the world's experts crawling out the woodwork, and it's like. You know, we know for a fact that this and that and whatever you... And I'm thinking it, once again, coming back to that piece of, of rhetoric, unless you've really been on the ground, unless you've really understood what's gone on, you know, and looked at both sides, which which journalists should do, that the impartiality should, should prevail, then, you know, these experts should, should really kind of go back into the cupboard and close the door and, and really not come out. Because it, all it does is it actually sparks more horrible debate 
heated debate, really, like, you know, of, of people who are experts who, at the end of the day, you know, create this kind of wave of, of insecurity. Uh, just before the, what's happened in Israel, everybody was an expert on Ukraine. Now they're all Israeli Gaza experts, aren't they? That's right, exactly. Yeah, and, and look, I'll give you an example of this as well. When I was in Nablus, I, I, I went up to a, a beautiful radio station. I was actually in there to, for, for what a couple of objectives, but one of them was to, to look at how we can start recruiting from Australia some of the actual local radio teams, you know, that can, we can get live on the ground very quickly and get the information back. And I was in this newsroom overlooking West Naples, and I said to one of the guys, I said, Jesus, you've taken a direct hit here. And he went, yeah. And I looked at it, and you could see the bullets, bullet holes through the window, and you could see them on the back of the wall as well. I said, well, that, what was that all about? And he turned around to me, and he said, ah, oh, we said something wrong against Hamas at the time, and they just opened fire from behind the mosques, you know, 762, bang, all the way through. And I thought to myself, like, you know, this, these are the, the people that deserve the medals. These are the people that are, have to remain impartial. But at the end of the day, you know, come under severe threat every single day of the week. And I've come across these time and time again, Colin. I've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. And uh, in 2021, uh, we, we got 12 families out of Afghanistan. And these guys themselves that we got out were under threat from Taliban mm-hmm. because they were military liaison officers for Taliban. And they were having to bring information back, you know, to to the to news teams. And uh, at the end of the day, if they said something wrong, or whatever, and, and that is, you know, that, you know, if you fail a bad report as a West kind of RPG, you know, you'll get a slap across the wrist. You fail a, a bad report on the ground, your chances, your family are you exactly. going to get hurt or killed with the locals. As one warning, one guy said something wrong, and an RPG was fired into his living room uh, just as he was as he was putting the kids to bed. Thank God it went through the whole house and then detonated on the other side of the uh, the compound. Bit of a multiple question in one here. What made you leave the BBC? What made you go to Australia? And what made you form your company Zero Risk International? Well, I'll take the first one, okay? And I'll kind of have a laugh with this one because I, I met a guy in Paris a couple of years ago and I said to him, I said, uh, he was Australian, he was in Paris, and I said to him, so what made you come to Paris? And he <laughs> me, said, a woman, of course. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like an Ernest Hemingway answer, like, you know? And it was, it was that with me. I'll never forget this, November... The November before I left anyway, and I left in the kind of the April, and we'd, we'd applied to go to, to Australia. We'd had a visa application in, taken a while to get to, to Australia, but I didn't even think it was going to happen. So in the meantime, I was given a huge promotion, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, to, to look after all these multiple departments. Like, and I was so, so happy. And I thought to myself, I've made it. I've, made, I've you know, scabby kind of medic, like, you know, from kind of the back streets of Liverpool, all of a sudden, you know, getting this dizzy height job. And, and I loved it. And and then I had a really big, severe conversation with my partner, Jill. And I said, what do you reckon? She goes, I, I'm still keen to go to Australia because my sister lives over there. It's, it sounds like a great opportunity. I want more for our daughter, Katie, which is fantastic. And I went into my boss at the time and I said to him, I said, oh, I had my resignation letter in my hand because the visa had come through. And he gave me the the ops order for me for the new job that it was he was going to put me into. And I said, oh, can you just hold on that? And he went, what? And I said, here's my rest- letter of resignation. <laughs> and I, w- I won't say on there what he said, but it was actually a, a low expletive that, you know, volleyed towards me. Like, you know, I kind of survived that. I just turned around to him and I said, no, nah, I'm off. And, 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 and all due respect to him, he, you know, he shook my hand and he said, he said, I know for a fact you'll do really well over there. And he said, you know, if you don't, don't go into a corporate job, he said, um, you know, you've done two big stints anyway with kind of, you know, corporate jobs with, you know, Her Majesty's Defence and and also the BBC. He said, so basically what I'd do, do a consultancy job. And I did, so I kind of started that off really. And I, I the funny thing was when I landed it in, in Australia, what happened to me was I was being pulled to come back all the time to go on another investigation or another job. Then we did the Olympics uh, for 2004 for an Australian t- uh, TV network here. And, and it just happened to be, you know, I was pulled every single way. Mm never really settled down in Australia straight away. And that caused the split for me and my partner, sadly. But I was stuck in a country and mm. I didn't know anyone. And of course, she'd moved on. She'd actually kind of got her own job with uh, my daughter. And it just felt like a defense days again, where you were moving around. And then, you know, sadly, yeah. the scourge of defense is the actual marital breakups, you know, for people that are living away all the time. And, and I, I was going through that and I thought, I, I can't believe this. I, I thought this wouldn't happen to me, but it did. But I, I loved coming to Australia. Yeah, it's been very kind to me. 
got a great place near the ocean and kind of a long way from Liverpool. The fringes. It is, mate. I mean, you know, it's funny because in the book I write about the fact that I always thought that the uh, the sea was brown. I didn't realise it was. You know, yeah, there's no place. sharks in Liverpool. Tropical is your green. <laughs> oh, there is, mate. But they're all in politics. I remember visiting friends in Queensland a few years ago. We sat in this bar. And I think Queensland in particular has got everything that can kill you. And I was looking at this beach going, what a fantastic beach. And the guy's going, yeah, but you can't walk in the sand without shoes on because there's stonefish. If you paddle in the shallows, the box jellyfish will get you. And then if you go out too deep, a shark will have you. I don't know if you know this, but the Queenscliff Club itself is actually run by a lot of the, the, the Navy divers. Uh, they're all the kind of the big surf dudes. And, whatever. and it's great because, you know, the Navy themselves, they were obviously talking about the defence side of it. They get a chance to put something back into the community. And my mate told me a great story, Chief Petty Officer, Navy Diver. And he goes, Tony, he goes, it was really funny. He said, uh, the other day, he said, what happened was uh, they've got Tony Abbott, who was then the Prime Minister of Australia. And he said, and Tony Abbott was part of Queenscliff uh, Surf Club. And he turns up late for their training session. And uh, my mate from the Navy Dive Team turned around and he goes, Tony, Tony, Tony. He goes, this Standards, mate. Standards. So he, he made the prime minister do twenty <laughs> push-ups and twenty sit-ups. <laughs> I just hope that was amazing. You know, I know you're you're a Brit and you're a scouser through and through, but I just hope you haven't succumbed to that habit of wearing those budgie smugglers that Australians are fond of. Only on, only on clandestine moments, mate. Like you know, I get into the in the, pool, <laughs> the sea pool at five o'clock when it's dark, and I kind of slip on the flippies. Zero risk. Uh, have you just taken all those years of experience and applied it to how you want to run a business? to give the best uh, effect for a customer and you, you just continue to do that around the world now? So it started really in 2003 and, and I had the idea of, of Zero Risk and it came from an investigation I did uh, into Lebanon uh, where a guy was actually kind of uh, hit by a tank in a car, a tank round I should say. And um, I suddenly realized at the end of the day that there was no real centralized reporting of intel and that this could have been avoided, you know, and uh, the generals were wa- walking through kind of, you know, tiptoeing through risk really. I then left and obviously kind of set up Zero Risk. But to be honest with you, Colin, the mainstream of my work really was journalism, you know, for quite a few years. And then I actually managed to get a contract with Qantas and Jetstar to train their cabin crew with my team. I started pulling together a couple of ex-defense guys. And we got a great contract in doing self-defense for cabin crew. Uh, so working on the aircraft for Qantas and Jetstar really revolutionized uh, the training and what they can and what they could do. Uh, and it all came on the back of an audit, you know, for the company, um, which we went in and found the pilots themselves were having fractured risks and, you know, the accident rates were going through the roof. And we just found out that the training was too aggressive and, and um, you know, most people couldn't recommend, or sorry, couldn't, couldn't remember certain moves. So we got that done. We got the actual medical side done as well. Uh, and then from there, one of the breaks that I had, which is a bit of a weird one, but in 2016, uh, the Holy Artisan Cafe attack happened in Bangladesh, where quite a number of a large number of expats were killed over the period of two days. You know, not just overnight. And the boys went in. No, no, no. It was it was a real bungled affair. Um, so I was called in by uh, a lovely lady, uh, Tracy Walker from um, uh, the Kmart and Target Group for retail. And uh, I went into Bangladesh, and I then started to look at all of the security situations that were there uh, because it was. Uh, Jamal Mujahideen in Bangladesh with the terror group who are now linked still to ISIS, uh, remnants of ISIS anyway. And um, so what I did was I set up an incel there. I set up, uh, I ripped out all of the kind of uh, structures that they had where they were dispersed. So at the end of the day, they could, you couldn't really control them security-wise. And my team now go through there on a regular basis and uh, provide assistance for all the retail giants that move in and out of there. You know, so that was the, the real start of the next level or the next phase for zero risk, really. But what I did is I, I recruited hard and I've retained all of my team over the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. So it's been fantastic, actually. And they've all come with me on this journey and we've got new blood coming through. The core of the company, really, Colin, was uh, the uh, the Queen's Corridor. So the, the guys who did all the Queen's Corridor and SO19 as well, um, they've come on board to help me out. And uh, they're very interpersonal, very client relationship kind of facing as well. And uh, so that's been the, the game changer. Culturally, they know what's going on. Ethically, they know what's going on. You know, so it's it's a very very different kind of beast to to the normal Joe Blow security from many years ago, as you remember. You know, so the company, our company's gone from strength to strength. And next year, two thousand and twenty-four, uh, we've got some fantastic plans and some really great things in the pipeline right now. 
in too many cases, it's a race to the bottom. And if you maintain your standards as a professional security company, a lot of the times you have to maintain those standards for your own integrity and in, in what you're delivering. But too many companies, in my experience, are that rush to the bottom, keep the margins up, use third country nationals with, without the requisite experience, yep. that type of thing. Has that always been a struggle for you to maintain your integrity and professionalism? Not not a struggle because obviously you're doing it, but you, do you see that quite a lot in your industry where there's that rush to the bottom? To There is. And look, as some of the companies themselves, like, you know, I, I, I kind of cringe when I hear what else has gone on. You know, one company tried to offload one person to me and uh, I saw through this person straight away. And uh, this person prof- professed to be in the SAS and so on and so forth. Small world. It's only one call away, as you know. And all of a sudden we found out, but, you know, the, the boys are, are helpful from that point of view. Kind of, They're almost like a gatekeeper, which is great. You're right in what you're saying is that, you know, some people are willing to actually sacrifice the standards for for, the, for a, a better buck. We've never done that. We've never compromised. And what I've always believed in, Colin, as well, is that I've always believed that if you as the person is the one that's actually on the ground and becoming the operator, whether it's a PSD or kind of a, you know, geopolitical kind of analysis, yeah, analyst in certain areas, that you get the best money. I, I, I don't skimp on that. You know, I actually kind of reward my team for what they've done. And uh, we've got a very good, strong teamwork bond as well, where there's no egos on display. There's no one kind of bagging each other out. And the first sign of that, you can either try and rectify, or if you know for a fact it's going to become a, a cancerous growth, you have to remove it because it's not just the reputation, but it's also the experience that your client's going to get. And that's first and foremost for us. Like, you know, I think that what we've done is maintain contracts because we've been very honest with them and upfront and very, very professional, extremely professional. We'd always kind of have feedback, you know, 360 feedback for me and for the team as well. And the next level for us is that, you know, director of operations is going in next year. His or her job is going to be to maintain that level of, of uh, comfort. And so for somebody who's been involved in it, it's, it's really interesting to hear you, you talk about that. And it's still an issue that, that's going on. So we've already alluded to your book, mate. What made you decide to write it then? And what's it about? I was talking about it today, actually, because I'm doing some of these book tours now. And uh, I had some funny moments. I've actually done one in a, in a nursing home. And uh, all of a sudden, like, I'm kind of talking away to find out that five of them have fallen asleep already. That's, I haven't even got the first slide up. But, <laughs> but I, I, love, I love putting back in to the communities and, and everything else for that matter. You know, and it ranges from these big gin distilleries, like with 200 people, uh, to I've, I've actually got 400 students from a private school that I'm, I'm lecturing to. But to come back to your question, the, the actual interesting thing for me was that I was doing a, a, a radio piece here called Richard Feidler's Conversation Now, which is quite big in Australia. And uh, when I finished it, uh, a lot of the re- a lot of the listeners actually kind of uh, turned around and said, you should bloody write a book. You know, it's, it's definitely there. And, I, and for 10 years, I had, you know, the, the title Zero Zero Risk penned in, but I never did because we operationally we got really busy. But then all of a sudden, I did it because I'd had a few close shaves in my life. And I decided that I wanted to leave something of a, a legacy for the kids anyway to understand you know, what their dad went through. All too often what happens is like, you know, kids tend to turn around nowadays mm-hmm. and go, I didn't even know my dad, didn't even know what he did or, you know, what happened or whatever. So that was one thing really. And they always say generally that you're going to do that. You know, that's the reason why you write it. But I also wanted to give it as an inspirational cover for kids that are reaching 16, 17 or 18, who at the end of the day feel that their life is, is not really worth a, a dime. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, they're failing in examinations or they're not getting on with the parents or they're caught up with drugs as well, which is a huge scourge over here in Australia. So I want them to have that, to realize that, you know, sometimes the breaks themselves come in very different ways in life. And you might feel that you go through a hard time, but everyone goes through hard times, like, you know, so you need to pick up the pace, really. And it was also my personal testament, really, to myself, you know, to to kind of yeah. almost like debrief myself with all the stuff that I've done. And, it, and there's been many things, really. As you know, it's interesting it's because cathartic. we're sort of coming full circle now, just as we're, we're about to wrap up. I think what you're doing with those kids is important because you mentioned at the start that you didn't have a great start in life and you joined the forces to give your life a bit of meaning, a bit of direction. And that's very similar to me. I left school at 16, had some odd jobs before I joined up. So it does annoy me when you read in the papers, particularly sort of the left-wing press, they turn around and say, the armed forces, you recruit working-class kids as cannon fodder. There's, there's never any talk of the working-class kids whose lives have changed. I, I have a life now, as do you, that I would not be living now if it hadn't been for my time in the army. And 
don't get me wrong, there's people get Absolutely. taken in, churned out and damaged mentally and physically or even killed during the service. But I think it gives a lot more than people give it credit for. I just wonder what you thought about that. Again, I was talking about this this afternoon to uh, two ladies actually we were kind of having lunch with. Sorry, this morning, they should say. <clears throat> One of them was a Colombian, uh, which, which surprised me. And uh, not surprised me she's a Colombian, but surprised me with her particular take on this because we were very similar. And what we said is that uh, we'd love it that national service came back in, like, you know, so you give kids two years of, you know, because I said the, the, the thing for me is that I, I was lucky and probably the same as you, where your dad did teach you a few things. And my dad taught me how to sew, Life skills. how to iron, you know, how to cook, you know, so all these basic things that kids just don't even get now. You know, and if I give give my my uh, my partner's kids, or even my son for that matter, I give them a kind of a, a doona cover button that's missing, and I give them a needle and thread. Go on, see what you see what you can do with that kind of thing. Like you know, and they, they couldn't do it. But coming to your point, is it is one hundred percent the basis of what happened to me. You know, I look back at it now and I go, wow, that you know, every single thing I did, the discipline, the knowledge. The application, the leadership, the team, you know, they, this is why it's scandalous that, you know, the people do leave defense and they don't really have civilian companies yeah. taking them up straight away and saying like, you know, we can help you out. We can put you into a really good job because we recognize your skills. But sometimes what happens on interviews is like people come across, they don't come across the right way. And so, you know, people still need skills in how to apply themselves when they do get in front of a panel and what the things they can say and things they can't say. Like for me, the, the military was was an incredible kind of uh, it, it's like that the boys talk about it with the the marine side of it you know it's a it's a very exclusive club you know that's the big thing really like you know and but the doors are always open to people who want to come and, and join that club like you know and and you know as well as I do you know from your journey as well as that uh, it takes a lot of hard graft and you can't just sit on your coattails and go like you know I'm going to try and see if I can do you know. so where can people get your copy your book this is your sales pitch well my friend <laughs> so. It's funny, you know, because I'll tell you, I'll tell you a good story, actually. There's a guy called Mick Bride here, and he's, he works at the BBC. Or he lived, used to work at the BBC. And I had um, a, a pint with him some time ago, and it was hilarious because he said to me, what you've got to do with your book, he said, you've got to get it, you know, noted in certain places, like, you know, on a, the desk. Because I do live TV interviews, like, in the morning for, for Channel 7. And I've done it, and I've managed to get it. And he goes, no, 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 no. He said, like this. And he showed me the footage of the BBC when he was working there. And it was an interview with Joe Biden, but they were given access to the Oval Office before the Biden interview. So he took out his book that he's just, you know, just just written and whatever, and it's America how uh, how to make it a great again, and he put it right in Joe Biden's book selection. <laughs> That's good publicity. <laughs> so you know, so you, you, exactly. But for my one, uh, it's now been released in um, in Australia, and New Zealand, and on the sixth of November it got released in the UK, so it should be in the bookshops. But if it's not in the bookshops, it's in the airports. So I know that I've seen it uh, knocking around. We're waiting to try and get into the states if we can. But the big thing is with the book as well is it's on Kindle, mm-hmm. uh, it's on Amazon. You can download it from Amazon anywhere in the world. And also from my point of view, breaking news on your program, my friend. Uh, I've just been oh, fantastic. I just got the contract to do the audio book. Yeah, which is a, a very different kind of beast. And apparently, they want me to do the audio book. <laughs> But I don't know whether to do it in a Scottish accent. Well, get away you with. still, you still got, a, you've got a transatlantic world accent. Well, at the minute. There's still a hint of Scouse in there. Do you know? Sometimes, like, I cringe because someone turned around and go, "What part of Wales?" I've been in the army about what? 15 years or so, and I went home to meet an old school friend, and uh, we're in the bar, and somebody said to him, "Who's your English friend?" I'm not one of these rabid nationalists, but it made me nearly cry. As usual, we're going to finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is our guest choice of book, film, and luxury item. Tony, if you were to go to Desert Island, what book, film, and luxury item would you pick? Look, I, I kind of this is, a, this is a tough one. I'm going to kind of uh, box around a bit here, but one of my best reads that I, I liked was uh, right, A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khaled Hassini. Um, he's the guy that wrote the kite. Yeah. But I've really got into, and it's probably going to shouldn't be doing this, but it's, it's a great plug for this guy. But uh, I met Ben McIntyre spy novelist recently he came out to Avalon to launch one of his books but his stuff that he's written now it, I, I just get captured by it and there's always this really weave of a thread between all the books so if you were coming off the island and you would only read the one book you know for a fact there's another seven intriguing novels that are he does Agent connected. Zigzag and all that type of thing is that correct? yeah I've got Agent Sonia at the moment you know and I've got uh, you know a few others that I've read along the way but uh, I love what he's written and film wise I 
I think I'm going to go comedy actually for a bit of light relief, like you know. But the one thing that used to happen years ago in the uh, in uh, in Four Tuesdays, Four Two Commando, is that you get to Norway, and there was a box there, and the box would be all the same venue of the hall. I don't know if you remember this, like you know, and all of a sudden it arrived. Yeah, yeah, the video. So the VHS would be in there on a pink cushion, and it was always uh, the Blues Brothers uh, that would actually kind of come out, like and it would go on there, and, and that was it. Attached to the Marines, I'm asking this last one with a bit of trepidation. Luxury item. It's not a dress or something that you've always got packed in your Bergen, is it, mate? (laughs) (laughs) Buddy, I'll definitely just be talking to you. Um, Luxury items. Um, I'm partial to a really nice single ball, I must admit. That's that's one one item I'd like anyway. But uh, look, the thing, it sounds really weird, but the thing for me is I have always liked, it sounds boring maybe, but 20th century modern poets, you know, some of that stuff really, when you get that book, yeah, you flick through John Betjeman. You know, John Betjeman was fantastic as a, as a poet and very, very funny. Have you ever heard these, the, the album Banana Blush where John Betjeman narrates poetry over his own poetry over like a 1930s soundtrack? Right, mate, I'll email you the link. It's on Spotify. No, I haven't. Right? You've no, got to listen. That's magical. You could sit there with your single okay. wall listening to that. It's, it's amazing. I'll send you oh, a link after God. after this podcast. That is fantastic, mate. I look forward to that. Thanks fantastic. for coming on the, the podcast. I've really enjoyed that chat we had there. And also thanks to the listeners for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. If you've downloaded some iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get your podcast from. And thanks again to Nick Beale for his continuing help and support through his company ISA. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier.